these values are not only for the Harpen Bull model, but they're actually like just just Christian values for the believer that aren't actually emphasized enough in the church, but they actually apply most in the context of prayer and worship. Um, so we'll talk about those as well. Um, okay, so those are really the components of uh, that we're going to be laying out and touching on this week. So um, in the second half of this morning, we're going to break it, break up into different groups, and we will um, walk you through some of the basics of the Harp and Bowl model, and then we'll start to do it. And it's going to be really fun and exciting. And then the cool part is we'll, ha we'll stay in those same groups throughout the week, and then and on Wednesday and on Friday, you guys will be leading us in a prayer room up here from this from this platform right here. And so we're going to actually have you be leading us in an intercession set and a worship with the word set where we meditate on the word and sing the word of God together. Okay, so this is like not just a conference where you sit in the chair and just listen and receive and take notes, which is good, but it's an activation. It's like we want you to get it and experience it and catch it, right? Some things are caught more than taught, right? And this is like throughout this week, we want you to catch some things because one of the YWAM values that I love is do first, then teach, right? You have to do it in order to teach your people back where you are in order for them to get it, right? You can't just take something that's head knowledge and then communicate it to them and expect them to do it too. You have to be equipped and activated in doing it so that then you can communicate it and pass it on to someone else. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, for the last part, before we go back into just a devotional and soaking and loving on Jesus, um, I just want to outline really quick the basic three components of the Harp and Bowl model. Okay. How many of you are unfamiliar with the basic components of the Harp and Bowl model? Okay, good. We have a few here. I, everybody else knows them, right? Okay, so everybody tell me, what's the first component of the Harp and Bull model? First, first step, first stage of the Harp and Bull model. No, no, you know it. <laughs> Corporate worship, yes. So we have one. Corporate worship. Okay, and the goal of corporate worship is that we all go somewhere together, right? So you want to choose well-known worship songs that everyone knows. You know, if you're just kind of doing your singer-songwriter thing where no one knows the worship song, you're not going anywhere together. You have an audience, not participants at that point, right? You want participants. This, the the one of the goals of the Harp and Bowl model is engagement for everyone in the room. Everybody can play, right? This is an inclusive thing that we want everyone singing and being involved and engaging their hearts with Jesus, right? So a prayer room, um, by its very nature, is corporate. It's about what we're doing, not about what the worship leader is doing because he's the, the the most talented and skilled person, and we all just go, wow, isn't he awesome? Or it's not just about what the worship team is doing. It's about engagement. So there's a responsibility that happens automatically when you walk into a corporate prayer room. This is not just about you and Jesus. It is about you and Jesus. But it goes beyond that to we can only go as far as we all go together, right? Um, it's kind of like that show, The Weakest Link. You know, there's this element of like, hey, if, if there's an element of people that are resisting, it's going to hinder our progress as to how far we go together. Does that make sense? So that's important. Like, we're all going after this. It's not just we're relying on the worship leader. We're sitting back and going, worship leader, just take me in, you know? Why, don't, why aren't you stirring up my emotions? Why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you doing it for me? Do all the work for me, worship leader. No. We're actively 
setting our hearts to go, I'm part of the worship team, even if I'm not on the band. Does that make sense? And it's actually, as a worship leader, this is one of my, my biggest um, passions and convictions is that actually the worship band and the worship team can only go as far as the hunger of the people in the room. The worship team can't go higher than the people in the room, right? The goal of the worship team is to get underneath the people and help lift them up and thrust them into the throne room. Not to say, we're going to go there without you, but to actually be, it's this partnership that as worship leaders actually feel the, the response to God that's happening among the people in the room, we actually feed off of that. Does that make sense? We're encouraged as people respond, not just by your outward demonstration, but by your hearts. Like you can tell when people are engaged, even if they're sitting there like this with their eyes closed, you can tell they're engaged, you know? And so there's this component of this model serves as a corporate engagement tool, right? So with corporate worship, you choose well-known worship songs, and you also want to choose songs that are directed um, speaking to Jesus, not just about Jesus. You know, like How Great Is Our God is an awesome declaration song, right? But it's not necessarily directed to Jesus like I'm talking to him because it makes all the difference in the world, right? There is power in proclaiming a truth about the greatness of God in a song. I'm not denying that, and we should have those types of songs in our mix. But something changes when you begin to see God as a real person that you're singing to, right? Like, I love you means a lot more than just you're then just God is great. Does that make sense? It's personal. It shifts something when you begin to believe that you're actually talking to a real person. And that's the point. Worship is supposed to connect us like God is real and he's intimate and he's alive. And I'm talking to him, not just about a distant God somewhere that's not involved. And though he may be amazing, He's, 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 he's far off. Does that make sense? So this creating, helping choose songs that are speaking to God is vital, okay? So we have corporate worship. We're going there together, okay? Um, so, we, so the idea is you do however many songs you wanna do, two, three, four worship songs. And sometimes you stick on one song because the, the Holy Spirit breathes on it. And do you need something? I don't know. Uh, Kelsey may have grabbed it. Oh, sorry. I don't think I grabbed it. Um, Lord, help us find the bag. Uh, see, he's involved in all the little details, right? Okay, so uh, the, I, was, I was saying you may just stick on one song and it lasts 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, and it's like, wow. I just can't leave this song and everybody's going somewhere together in this song and it's alive and it's dynamic. And other times you're like, okay, switch the song. It's been two minutes. This is not happening, you know? <laughs> and so you just kind of have to feel it out, right? Um, so usually it's like if we're talking about a two-hour prayer set, you know, you want to do um, 20, 30 minutes of worship right? Corporate worship. Then you move on to the second stage. Anybody know what the second stage is? Bowl. <laughs> Close. No eye hoppers can respond. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? So you go into corporate worship, then you flow right into... No? No? Nope. Okay. An eye hopper can respond. Marvin? Spontaneous singing, spontaneous singing, okay? So after corporate worship, you go into spontaneous singing. K, 
okay? And spontaneous singing, the goal of this is that uh, I like to use, um, you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to, uh, it, it's Ephesians 5.18, um, and it also says the same thing in Colossians 3.16, yep? And so it says that we should sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, right? It says in Ephesians 5, I love Ephesians 5, it says, this is how you get filled with the Holy Spirit. That's my, my little translation, right? This is how you get filled with the Holy Spirit, by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So Paul, to break it down a little bit, he gives us three different categories of singing, right? Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, it's a little bit different order that we do it in, but it's those three components, right? So, so um, what's a hymn? Hymn. Yes, a song that's already been written and bona fide. So it can be Amazing Grace, right? That's a great hymn or uh, the battle hymn of the Republic or, <laughs> you know, whatever ancient hymn, old school. But included... Included in that category of hymns, I include any song that's been written by someone else other than you, right? So it's their song. So it can be Chris Tomlin, Hill song, uh, Bethel, IHOP. It's their song, right? Because they wrote it. It's their song. So that's hymns, and that's corporate worship, okay? So we'll just put hymns right here. Is that making sense? hymns, okay? So then we have spiritual songs. And if you actually look up in the Greek what that word actually means, it's the song of the heart. It's the individual song, right? And that's spontaneous singing. So you've noticed that a couple times during the last few days when our team has been leading worship, we'll say, hey, let's all sing our own song together, you know? And everybody lifts up their voices and, and we begin to sing. And it's like this, this harmony and this melody all in the room in like this wave of sound. And the idea is that during spontaneous singing, we're mirroring that thunderous sound that's happening in heaven when the saints lift up their voices. It says, uh, John says, and I heard a sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunderings saying, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And so, like, what's the sound of many waters sound like? Shh, right? It's white noise. It's this sound of, like, a wall of sound hitting you. It's, that, it's a waterfall. It's like, right? That's the idea behind spontaneous singing is it's many voices combined into one sound, you don't hear every individual drop of water, right? Plop, plop, plop. No, it's like, it's, it's a mighty chorus. It's like all singing together. And that's the idea is spontaneous singing is suddenly we begin to sing our own heart song that's from our core, I love you, Jesus. And everyone lifts their voice, right? That's the idea. Okay, and so one little point about this is Psalm 22, verse 3 actually says, the Lord is enthroned upon the praises of his people. Okay, we've heard that, vo that term before, the Lord is enthroned or the Lord dwells, his presence inhabits the praises of his people. Well, it's interesting, that's not just like any kind of praise. In, in the book of Psalms, there's actually seven different words for the, for, that are translated in English, praise. Seven different types of things. So um, there's halal, which means to dance wildly and rejoice before the Lord and spin, okay? And then there's toda, which means to lift up the hand and give thanks. And, but this specific type of praise, so when it says the Lord inhabits or dwells among the praises of his people, it's not just any kind of praise that he inhabits. Although I believe he comes because he just He's just, he loves us. He, he responds to us as we respond to him. That specific one, and it's the only time it says it in scripture, that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people is the word tehila. Everybody say tehila. No, not tequila. Tehila. And tehila means the spontaneous song of the heart. 
right? That's the kind of praise that the Lord inhabits. So I can't tell you how many times it's happened to me. We go corporate worship and it's just, it's awesome and I'm giving God glory and I'm feeling a little bit of his presence. But then we go into spontaneous singing and it's like he shows up. It's like he comes and there's this spontaneous song of the heart. So we have psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And that spiritual songs piece is spontaneous singing. And that's why we have it in the model. It's this, everyone singing their own heart song to the Lord. Are you with me? Question. Is the spontaneous singing prophetic singing? Oh, yeah, prophetic singing, yeah. Mm hmm yeah. You can call it prophetic singing as well. Although it's not one individual giving a prophetic song song word so to speak it's everybody and it's toward the lord yep it's ministering to him yeah so i love spontaneous singing and it's it's amazing how sometimes in the middle of spontaneous singing i don't know how it happens but uh, everyone will start singing a chorus together you know and it just erupts and it's like wow god and then and then it flows back into all of the the voices combining as one and everyone singing their own song okay are you guys with me okay so we do corporate worship 30 minutes ish spontaneous singing um i would say like a minimum of five minutes if we're going by the book you know those of us who are a lot more of the um j personality type on the Myers-Briggs, you know, we like things, you know, we're going to follow the clock, you know, whatever, uh, but you don't have to do that. Uh, but just around that time, you know, it's like five minutes-ish, but I've had it go 20 minutes sometimes, you know, and it's just, it's awesome. Um, but you don't have to force it. You just let the Holy Spirit flow. Okay, so corporate worship, spontaneous singing, and the third part, third stage, anybody know what it is? Intercession, um, the answer is yes, uh, but I'm looking for a different wording of it. Yes. Krista? Developing a passage yes. Developing a passage through responsive singing. So I'm just going to put developing, if I can spell here, D V E. Developing a passage. Now, this is key because I've heard it said sometimes when people tell me these three parts and I, they're from different places or they haven't really been taught the model before, I say, hey, what's the third stage? And they say, uh, they say um, singing, singing the word. And I, and I say, no, it's not just singing um, or it's not just responsive singing right? Because sometimes people, I've seen it in different houses of prayer, they, they do really good responsive singing, but it's not around a passage. And this component, I can't state it enough, houses of prayer will not continue long term if they're not rooted in the word of God in every single set. It doesn't matter what style, it doesn't matter what focus, it doesn't matter what, what flavor you have. If it's not rooted in the word of God, people getting into the scriptures and letting it become a part of them, it will not continue and it will not be the thing that God is looking for on the earth because his word is uh, powerful and it's the thing that transforms us. Singing moves us, but singing does not transform us. The word of God is what transforms us. It says, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. By what? A good idea? A nice thought? A good imagination that you have? A prophetic word? The word of God, the written word of God. So we like to call this part the singing seminary, right? When you go to seminary, you go to study God's word, right? Um, and this is where we study God's word and we go somewhere together in a passage of scripture. So developing a passage. Everybody say passage. 
we're in the Bible. We're, we're, we want to be those who have so much of the word of God inside of us that it just flows out of us naturally. And one of the ways we get that is by singing it. So this is where we'll, um, I'll let the, the coaches kind of take you a little bit deeper into this idea. But basically, if it's intercession, we pray from a biblical prayer, okay? Something that one of the apostles prayed or someone in the scriptures prayed already because those are model prayers that we need to learn from and grow from and they're packed full of the knowledge of God. They're packed full of what's God's will for a specific region or a specific request. And I challenge you to find a, find a prayer in the Bible that can't be applied to any request any request. There is one of the apostolic prayers or one of the prayers in the scriptures that applies to every single thing in our lives. Everything. Uh, big picture to small picture. One of those prayers you can find that, that will guide you into what God's will is for that specific situation or problem or issue. Amen? I love that idea that God made a way for He didn't just be like, find out what to pray, guys. He goes, I'll teach you what to pray. And, and uh, so I'll, te- I'll model for you what to pray because Paul prays for the church, right? And then I'll give you the Holy Spirit inside of you that will help you know what to pray even when you don't know what to pray, right? He doesn't leave us alone. He doesn't leave us without a, a pattern to follow, okay? There's more, much, much more to talk about in that. So that in intercession, so we'll pick, you know, I just... I love Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. I've been play, praying this one for 15 years. That the Father of glory would give to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened or flooded with light. That we might know what is the hope of his calling. The greatness of his inheritance in the saints and the power of that's available for those of us who believe. And so I'll, I'll quote that passage and then I'll launch into my prayer that's emphasizing some of the key points of that prayer. So I'll go, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the church in Barbados that you would open up their eyes, release the spirit of wisdom and revelation that they might actually know Jesus more, that they would not just fall into that therapeutic moralistic deism, but they would fall in love with Jesus, the person of Christ, Christ, knowing his, his, from his incarnation to his resurrection and his ascension and glorification and everything that he is for us and, and in us and um, through us, that he would, they, the church would know him, right? So that's kind of like me launching off of Ephesians 1, praying for the church of Barbados. Is that cool? And so that's the way we want to model our prayers. And there's power in those prayers and there's unity in those prayers, because how many times have you been in a prayer meeting where someone prays something and you're like, I don't know if I can really agree with that. You know, like, well, that might be a little off. Where'd they get that theology? You know, whatever. Um, or it's like they're praying for their sick grandma, which is like, should we pray for our sick grandmas? Yes. <laughs> but not everybody's like as passionate as you are about praying for your specific sick grandma. <laughs> right? But we can all be in agreement on that prayer that the word of God says. It's the word. So it creates unity. We can all agree on that one specific prayer. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's intercession. And then in this part, um, we can do a worship with the word or meditating on the word, singing the word of God. So what happens here is we'll pick a passage of scripture. Let's just pick Psalm 23 more of a devotional style um, of a passage. You know, you don't want to take some theological uh, uh, exposition from uh, Romans 11, let's say, or Romans 9, you know, about all of those intricacies. Did God forsake Israel or, you know, like those are like big theological issues Um, or like you don't necessarily want to pick a passage from the book of Leviticus 
you know, that's going through the sacrifices and they, you know, make sure you cut this specific part of the bird in half and then, you know, <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff. You want to pick a devotional passage, you know, John 15, abiding in the vine and one of the Psalms, a passage from Song of Solomon, uh, one of the hymns of Revelation that we find in the book of Revelation that's all about the greatness and the power of God to redeem humanity, you know, like these great truths that we can sing back to God. Okay, so you pick a passage and then you break it into a few different chunks and you say, okay, let's just focus on verse one of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then you begin to develop that passage. What I mean by develop is, and this takes a little bit of preparation beforehand, is to actually gather some cross-references of verses that talk about the same truth of the Lord is my shepherd, right? So you might look up in a concordance the word shepherd and look up different scriptures that use that same word. You know, so Revelation 7 says that the lamb at in the center of the throne will shepherd you and lead you to living waters. You know, so that's one reference. And so you can begin, oh, what, how does that mean the Lord is my shepherd, but he's also the one that's at the end of the age going to shepherd his people into the place of living waters. And, you know, and then, okay, what's the idea of being a shepherd? Oh, maybe it's him uh, his leadership is emphasized there, but it's also his care is emphasized there. And it's also like we trust him, you know, because he leads his sheep and the sheep only follow one shepherd. John 10, you know, is Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, you know? So you begin to develop the passage by extracting the deeper meanings that are confirmed by other passages of scripture. And you begin to get this picture before you that then displays a part of the nature of God, and then we respond to that. Because he's a shepherd, I say, yes, I will follow you. And you begin to have this dialogue with the Lord as you're singing different passages of scripture. And it's glorious, and it's fun, and everyone's involved, and you sing together, and you, you begin to um, actually enjoy and have fun in God's word. Amen? God's word is not stale and boring. We're boring. <laughs> right? You're boring. That's why God is the most exciting being in the universe and his word is alive and active and living and we're boring and that's why we have trouble. <laughs> we need to just go, okay, Lord, help us. Help us. <laughs> Your word is awesome and alive, and we have not esteemed it that way. And we've not given it the attention we should, and we haven't actually sung the word the way we should. Because I believe the entire Bible is meant to be sung. Did you know Hebrew tradition says that God sung the world into existence? He didn't just speak it into existence. Tradition says that he sang it into existence. Job 28 or 38, says that the morning stars sang together when God created the universe, when he created everything, right? And then uh, there's actually in, in the Hebrew writing of the text of the scriptures, there's notations at the top of all of the different words and scholars for, for generations have been confused and going, why in the world are there all of these, at least Western scholars, have been confused like, why are these notations all on the top of the different words throughout the entire Bible, the Hebrew scriptures? And they come to find out they're musical notations. The whole Bible was meant to be sung. The book of Psalms was meant to be sung, right? And we're rediscovering God's intent for the scriptures. It's not only... Uh, how does that acronym go? Basic instructions before leaving earth, right? We see it as a textbook. I don't think that's the way. We're meant to see it as this living, interactive book that the Holy Spirit breathes on and we sing it back to him as a response to who he is. Amen? This is awesome. The word of God is so powerful and alive, okay? So, to kind of sum up, did you want to add something? A question. 
Oh yeah, let's do it. How it works. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so to sum up, everybody say corporate worship, spontaneous singing, and developing a passage. Okay, and I love what Krista's full sentence was, by or through responsive singing and praying, right? For those of us who aren't the best at singing. Um, but so it's that idea like prayers and, and songs flowing together within the word of God, creating this dynamic response and picture that we get to go somewhere together in God's word. It's awesome. It's exciting. Okay. So we've found that houses of prayer that want to do continuous, sustained prayer throughout the days and nights, if they use this model, it's actually possible. It's actually doable. And it's not just some rigid, you have to do this every single time, but use it. Use it and maybe shift some. If you're like, okay, this part isn't connecting with our community, cut it out and use something different, you know? Like make it your own, make it alive, make it yours. But, I mean, the testimony of Kansas City is that for the last 19 years, they haven't stopped. One minute. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at 3 a.m., at 1 a.m., at 7 a.m., at noon, at 3 p.m., God looks down the balcony of heaven and he sees incense rising from Kansas City. And he is so pleased. It's weak. Believe me, I've been in the back meetings, in the back rooms. <laughs> it's weak. It's broken. It's normal people just like you and me that have our weaknesses and leadership failures and sin and junk. But it's happening. It's a sign and a wonder that's happening. And it's an inspiration to people like you and people like me all throughout the nations that it's possible. If those weak people like Mike Bickle can do it in Kansas City, he's not a singer, he's not a musician, he's just a Bible teacher, and he's leading a singing prayer room. <laughs> if God can use a weak, I mean, his dad was a boxer. He grew up in bars when he was young, you know? Like, if God can use that guy, to do that, he can use you and encourage you and bring us together into this, okay? Amen. So let's use this this week. Let's grow in it. Let's learn it. And um, yeah, let's have Sharon and Krista real quick just give an example of how this works. Question? Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for bringing up the fact that the, the, the markings in the Bible are actually teaching the Bible. Oh, awesome. We're just going to do Psalm, Psalm 23, 23, as you said. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to do corporate worship, spontaneous singing, and then we're going to develop Psalm 23. So when they get to Psalm 23, they're going to sing it, sing certain responsive phrases back and forth, and then they're going to come out with a chorus 
Now, when they come out with a chorus, don't just sit there and go, wow, cool chorus. Join in, right? That's the point. This is a corporate prayer meeting where we're meditating on the word together. So join in, sing, pray, engage, right? Can we do that together? Amen. Great. And also, so I'm going to just do one, uh, the chorus of a corporate worship song. But... Um, right after that, we're going to go into spontaneous singing, and that's not just for us on the yeah. stage. I want to hear everyone singing their own song, singing in the spirit, or singing in your own language, or singing in another language you know. Let's all lift up our voices, and then we'll jump into developing the passage. So. You're all I want.
So you can all open up to Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3. And we're going to be singing specifically around those uh, phrases and those themes. And so as we're singing, just meditate on the words, pray phrases back to the Lord from the word. Um, and then when we, so we'll sing responsively back and forth. And then when we start a chorus, join in and sing the chorus to the Lord. Okay, so Sharon's going to introduce the passage.
exactly where to lead so I can rest even under your wings God I can rest even under those wings God I will take refuge in your wings God safe in the shadow of the almighty Rest in peace with my Father watching me. Lying down in those green pastures. Resting in those still waters. That's who you are, my faithful leader. That's who you are, my good, good shepherd. That's who you are, my faithful leader. That's who you are, my good, good shepherd. That's who you I'm going to add one component. You guys can keep playing and we'll do it again. Um, I didn't mention the role of the prayer leader, okay? And the prayer leader is someone uh, that is a part of the worship team that helps to um, isolate the phrases so that the team stays focused on that specific phrase and doesn't jump to the next uh, the next phrase without there being clarity on what's happening. Okay, so um, we're going to do now we're going to do verse 3. Um, he guides me along the right paths for his namesake, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil. Does that sound good? Okay, so um, we'll just go into spontaneous singing real quick and then you'll see that Sharon will or if whoever else wants to Sharon yeah okay Sharon do it again and um, she'll introduce verse 3 and 4 and then you'll hear I will interject with the the phrases that will show where the singers are gonna sing I'm like painting a big target for them to hit and I'm also interjecting other phrases that are suggestions and um, kind of like fuel for the singers to sing as well, okay? So watch and engage and because there's gonna, you're gonna need this component um, because the goal of the model is not just for singers, it's to combine the prayer and the singing and the worship, right? And so there's going to be prayer leaders here, and you're going to, this is going to be your role a lot of times as part of the worship team.
okay? So you're going to help the singers go deeper in the passage, okay? So let's do it. I'm Gabriella. two people or you can do it with a whole band as we see Harry's jumping in Gabriella's jumping in so you can do it with any number of people um, stand if you're comfortable standing and lifting up your voice really engaging with the Lord asking him what is on his heart and then singing that back to him
Guide me in paths of righteousness. You guide me in paths of righteousness. You lead my heart. You lead my heart. You lead me on the right path. It's the right way. It's the right way. It's the good way. It's the good way. Guiding me by your spirit. Even though the way is narrow, I don't need to fear because you're guiding me. You guide me by the spirit living on the inside. Narrow is the way to life. Shining your light to guide me. Step by step you lead me on. Your word is the lamp unto my feet that keeps me on that narrow way. So I will stay here, meditate on your word. I love your way. I love your way. I love your word. I will follow you. I say yes to righteousness. I love your ways, Jesus. And I say yes, I say yes. I will follow the light that you shine on the path of righteousness. I will follow you all my days. I make this vow today. You are a good leader. You are a good leader. Even though I don't always know the way to go, I know I can trust you. And however you lead, you guide me in ways of righteousness. You guide me in the ways of righteousness. On your so way. Good leader, good shepherd, keep leading me away. So good leader, good shepherd, the righteous keep way. Leading me away. So good leader, good shepherd, keep leading me away. So good leader, good shepherd, keep leading me away. So good. You are a great leader, Jesus. So good leader, good shepherd, keep leading me away. So good leader, good shepherd, keep leading me away. So good leader, good shepherd, keep 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, even though I walk through the valley, when despair surrounds me, of frustration and fear overwhelmed by darkness overwhelmed by the pain of this life overwhelmed by confusion fear overtakes my life fear and pain consume my life when Everything around me looks like it's wanting to swallow me up. I've been brought down to the depths. Even in the depths of despair, even when the valley is all I see, I look to you. I look to you, Jesus. I I will fear no evil. Even when my heart is wavering, I look to you, God. For you are with me. For my hope is found in you. When things don't make sense on the outside, Still I will walk through the valley. Even through the valley of weeping. I will come up leaning. It's leaning on my beloved. Even in the valley of death. Even though I walk through the valley. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? Leaning. I will lean because my father is a good shepherd. I'll be leaning into you, even in the valley, even in the valley. I'll be leaning into you, even in the valley. I'll be 
we're going to go into the next phrase, but I just feel like there's some of you who have been going through a valley, and uh, whatever kind of difficulty that may be, if that's you, just raise your hand, and we're going to have others just come around you and pray and, and intercede for you. So keep your hand lifted up. Um, if you've been going through a valley season or you feel yourself in the wilderness or you feel a depression or you feel the enemy is is an there's an unusual attack um, let's so the rest of us you are you're you're um, deputized right now as the prayer team so let's all come around them lay hands on them speak life and let's let's uh, agree with Jesus about the calling and destiny and the plans of their life and even pray from Psalm 23 about Jesus being their shepherd. So Lord, we just thank you right now, Lord, for the seasons of the wilderness, that there would be no fear, that you would be their comfort. We ask you that they would walk through that wilderness and find you on the other side in Jesus' name. Even in the darkest valley, you are with me. Your presence is with me. Even in the darkness, your presence is with me. Though you feel so far away, you are here. Your presence is with me. You are with me. I go. You're my comfort. You're my comfort. You're my shield. It's I the confession of my soul that you are good and kind and near. You're my protector. I hold on to the truth of your word. You are with me. I you know you see. I know. You hear God even when I can't feel you. I know you are with me. Your presence is real in my life. Even if I were to make my bed in hell, you will be with me. There's nowhere I can run away from you. My strong tower. My strong tower. That I run to in times of need. Oh, my rock on which I stand. Oh, my rock on which I stand. You are my refuge. I look up to the hill. And where does my help come from? Everything changes except you. So I can trust your name. I can trust your name. I can trust your name. For you are with me. You're the commander of the angels. You command them to carry me. So my foot will not hit a stone For you have sent them out to carry me Good shepherd To carry me Good father To take care of me Good leader Are you not the good father? Great savior Are you not the good shepherd? Good King. You're the one that carries me in your bosom, close to your heart. You keep me. You keep me close. Would you not the one who's woven me 
know of everything I need. You are with me. With me, never leaving me. So in this time of shaking once again, I come and want you close. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but you alone remain. I'm beaten, but not crushed. You alone remain. Sing this together. You alone remain. 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 You Jesus, we love that you're our shepherd. We love that you're with us through the darkest valley. That you are our light and our salvation. We will not fear. You are with us. You are with us. You're the with us God. We trust you today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Awesome. All right, before we head to coffee break, um, I just want to have like a question and answer time. You guys saw, maybe some for the first time, 
this harp and bowl model, okay? And I want you guys to chime in too, and uh, you guys to maybe ask questions and go, hey, I didn't understand what you did there. Chris, how did you know to do that? Or da da da, you know, like whatever um, questions you may have, like what was going on? So anybody have any questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Um, so the communication flow is really simple. So Sharon and I are doing most of the communication. As you see, maybe you saw that we we're like looking at each other, different things. So instead of having every option open, we could go into a worship song, go into spontaneous singing, all of these things. We know what's next, what will come next. And of course, if we want to do something else, if the Lord leads something, that's great. But we know, unless we communicate with each other, what's coming next. So when we're developing a passage and we're singing back and forth responsively, we know exactly what's next. We know that the chorus is next. So if I look at her and go like this, then she probably knows, oh, I know the next part, so that probably means she wants me to go into a chorus. Or if, uh, if she says to me, okay, stop doing the chorus, I know what's next you go back into responsive singing again. So it's not that she says, stop, and I'm like, oh my goodness, does she want me to do a worship song? Does she want me to give a prophetic word? Does she want me to um, read another passage of scripture? I'm not trying to figure out what possibly she could mean, because you can't really communicate that much with, you know, it's, <laughs> it's pretty limited. But because we know what's coming next, it's so clear. I can be like, yes, and then she knows, or right. that sort of thing. And when we're singing, we did it a clinical style where we all took turns. So the worship leader kind of has, um, what's the right word? Like, I don't want to say preeminence, but like uh, you have, so if she starts singing, we all stop. Even if we start at the same time, we'll, um, I'll defer to her and that's so on. Daniel will defer and Marvin will defer. So, but at some time, we kind of went into popcorn a little bit but normally when we're teaching it, we just go one, two, th just down the line, and we'll just repeat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pop we so call it popcorn. Yeah, popcorn, yeah. popcorn yeah. it would Meaning be like, whatever. Okay, I go Daniel, yeah. Marvin, it could be Sharon, me, back to Marvin. Whoever like, has just, something. Yeah. But we know yeah. if we were doing popcorn and say Daniel and I went at the same time, he knows to stop singing if I'm singing, and I know to stop singing if Chris is singing because she's the worship leader. Yes. Yes. That's there's clinical. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. clinical. No, no, no. There's, oh, the order is oh, always order. when you're singing at the <laughs> yeah. same time. Like a hierarchy. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And then, so if we were singing at the same time, I'll just pull back um, um, and and uh, hold on to my phrase and just sing it after she's done. So in that um, way, we all know it's audible. With yeah. The oh God. Yeah. Or a name of Jesus. A uh, name of the Lord. Like oh, when you're finished with a chorus, yeah, with right? Is what you're talking about? Yeah. 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 When you're finished with a chorus, or you notice, uh huh. When yeah. she, when Sharon introduced the passage, she sang through the all the verses at the very beginning. She said, "Oh God," at the end, and that was a signal to me. Oh, she's ready for me to isolate which phrase we're going to focus on first. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. same, and I think what you're saying as well is that's how you know when to end the chorus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I was doing. Oh, well, oh we on. lost the keyboard. Ah. Can I have the keyboard back? <laughs> um, oh, I don't even exactly remember. Only you remain. Only you remain. Only you. ending with the name of God so we know oh That's all the, the singers know oh I'm gonna stop singing so I'm not the only one left singing you know? yeah it's good great question yeah any name of God. is there someone else over here okay. all right um, okay in, in some scenarios you may have you may not have as many as six persons mm -hmm. all right, right. Can I just give a small demonstration of just doing it with one person? Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you did the corporate worship song, that's easy. You just do the corporate worship song by yourself. Spontaneous singing, 
you just sing by yourself. So that's pretty clear. But if you want Real to quick, do, yeah. can we repeat the question for the recording? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how do you, so I think she asked, how do you do, how do you do Harp and Bowl if you only have one person? Because it's nice when you have one, two, three, four, five, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people, that's awesome. But how do you do it with just one person? And corporate worship, you just sing a corporate worship song. I think we're all pretty comfortable with that. Spontaneous singing, you just play a chord progression and you sing spontaneously. But developing a passage, I'll just do it really briefly. I'll just take Psalm 23 again, the Lord is my shepherd, and I'll do it all by myself. So I'll do the responsive singing, responding to myself and what the Lord says to me, whatever. And then I'll make a chorus, and then I'll end the chorus, and then you can go back in. So, um... The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he makes me to lie down, lie down in green pastures, Jesus, Jesus you are, you are my shepherd. You're close, you're close to me. You're acquainted with me wherever I go. Wherever I go, you're with me. You're with me, leading me. The Lord is my shepherd. shepherd God always leading me leading faithfully the Lord is my shepherd God always leading me leading faithfully so it's more work if you have to do all of it by yourself and I love singing with others because Daniel has a different perspective of God and different experience with this than I do and Marvin and Sharon and Aaron um, but you can you can do it by yourself and one thing I would say though if you're doing it by yourself you're gonna have to have a deep life in the word so study it yeah. know what you're talking about pray about it um, take a passage that you're familiar with um, and just ask the Lord, what are, you, what are you saying about this passage? So that's a great question. How do you do it by yourself? You just do it exactly the same way. Except it's easier because you don't have to worry about the communication. Mm -hmm. But you miss out because you don't get everyone's unique perspectives. And just to say, in Kansas City, our team, we actually, every Friday, we have a little prayer meeting. No sound system, just an acoustic guitar or a keyboard. And we do this model. You know, just and you, you know, our team is like ten people, but we kind of go. Everyone's a singer. Anyone can pray, and we have this awesome flow that happens uh, without a sound system. You know, so the sound system doesn't have to be like this expectation. You have to have all these awesome microphones and the keyboard and everything. You know, like you can do it in the context of your home. You can do it in the context of your family. You can do it in the context of a bunch of friends get together and and you don't have a, a necessarily a building. You could do this outside. Like, it's, gonna, it's an awesome, flexible, sustainable model um, for any location. And also, you can do any style of music with it. Um, you can do reggae. You can I wish do... I could do reggae. <laughs> um, I mean, we've had country western style worship leaders, you know, that love that kind of stuff. Like, there's rap. That happens all the time in the prayer room, specifically on Justin Rizzo's team at IHOP Kansas City. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. What's that? Calypso. Calypso, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Could I add something to, like, when you do it alone? Um, obviously, you don't have to sing the whole time. Like, uh -huh. if it's, like, a two-hour set or something like that, like, singing the whole time can be very, very exhausting. So even, especially when you're alone, there's a, there's a good... Um, you know, just find good times where you have like a, you know, what we call sela or, you know. Just instrumental. Just like a little instrumental part where um, 
where we can, or you know, where where you as a, as a worship leader or as the one playing, kind of like can ponder on and and just think and talk with the Lord, and also give the room um, time to think about what was being sung and think about the passage and think about you know their their different ways and for them uh, to talk with the Lord. So. That's good. Any other questions or thoughts you had about our time together this morning? Yeah, his observation the singers or the prayer leader are throwing out phrases, um, kind of looking for the revelation or the thing that God wants to emphasize in the moment. And uh, I think that's an awesome way to think about it. Sometimes I've described um, when you're doing it with a team of people, it's like you're writing a sentence or you're writing a paragraph, you know? So you'll, you'll write, each, each person has a part that continues the sentence and builds upon the sentence until that, that sentence keeps going, going, you're talking about God and, you know, imagine writing it on a page or on a whiteboard, you know, you're writing this sentence down until there comes like the chorus or this specific song, maybe it's one phrase, two phrases, three phrases, that are then repeated that everyone can join into and sing along with, that is like uh, the summary statement a little bit of, ev of that entire paragraph. You know, sometimes when you're reading a book and, and someone want, really wants to make the point clear, at the end of the paragraph, they'll summarize what that entire paragraph was about, right? And that's what we call the chorus. And the chorus really is that um, definitive truth, statement to God or about God that, that we want to get stuck in our minds and our hearts, you know? Like when we leave from here, I want to be singing, what was the chorus? You alone remain. Like I want to be singing that all day. Like that truth, God remains. Like that will encourage my heart throughout my day in whatever trials I face or difficulties, you alone remain, you know? And I, so the goal of those choruses is that it would be stuck in our heads you know, because we've sung it over and over and over and over and over. Um, so I love that. Any other thoughts? Can I say one thing? Yeah. So, so in Kansas City, we obviously have a lot of people, um, but I just want to give—I just want to testify to the power of the harp and bull model in sustaining prayer. So, I was working in a, a prayer room in Hong Kong. Um, we would do big events, but then we would also do like small things with just three, four, five people. We went four hours a day, five days a week, and we didn't burn out. We didn't run out of things to say. So 20 hours a week, like we just kept going deeper and deeper and having more and more to say and more and more to pray about. So I, I just want to say as someone who's been doing um, pr there are so many amazing ways to do prayer, and I love incorporating different ones. But I just want to say for sustainable prayer and biblical prayer, I've been doing this for the last, uh, like, over six years, and um, usually with very few people in the room, often with small teams or by myself, and it works. It gets you into the Word. It forces you into the Word, and the Word just makes your heart come alive and want to connect with the Lord. So it's possible. It most places will never look like IHOP and they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to be these huge mega ministries. Oh, well, who knows what the Lord will do in the future. But um, this works with one person, two people, living room, really small house of prayer. So I just want to say that after more than six years of doing it, it's really, really sweet. Yes. Yeah. 
Any other thoughts? We'll take a coffee break.